For as long as there has been the concept of history, there has been a battle over that history. Different sides and factions interpreting history differently, sometimes distorting it or overlooking certain things or intentionally ignoring context to make their side or their ideology look a little bit better. Look no further than the years-long struggle in America between the quote-unquote patriotic education that focuses on the moral virtues of America and how that stacks up with other places in the world or other times in history versus the more Howard Zinn style of history education that tends to focus more on issues of class struggle and race and the impact of American policies and ideology on minority groups and the little guy. But what if this question of perspective and ideology in history could be resolved? What if there was a way to determine which side of history or which perspective in history was superior? What if you could go back in time and watch history unfold before your eyes? There would be no need for nuance, no need for interpretation, no more competing perspectives. There would just be what happened, right? Ken Liu's award-winning short story, The Man Who Ended History, focuses on just this hypothetical idea. All of the ramifications that might unfold as a result of this history time machine and what all of this says about the way we study history and how we value history as a society. I don't think I'm going to go over all of the plot points of this particular story, but I'll try to link to it in the show notes, and I definitely recommend giving it a read. The central idea of the story is that a researcher in the future at some point basically makes a time machine that allows people to go back into the past and witness the events of history. The catch is that you can only go back to a certain event a limited number of times before you sort of use up the ability to look at that particular event. So this concept brings up a ton of interesting questions about the way we study history, the things we value, and who gets to decide what's important about history. One question I think that's worth asking is, would this time travel thing be the end of history? Would it be the end of narratives and piecing together different viewpoints about the past if we could just go back and have a entirely factual account of what happened? Would that eliminate the need for some of those ideologies and historical battles that we talked about at the beginning of the episode? In the story, many of the characters as this debate is unfolding in the story express this worry about what it would mean to sort of end history and how that would affect our shared culture and our understanding of our common humanity. But I would venture to guess that a time-traveling instrument like this might not actually create the certainty about the past that some characters in the story think it would. Some might say, okay, we can now go back to the past right to the moment where the Declaration of Independence was signed, and determine which founding fathers were virtuous paragons of American values and which ones were slave-holding sketchballs, right? But the reality is that just going back to one moment in time isn't going to give you a full picture, because we wouldn't have the context of how that moment took place, we wouldn't have the results of what that moment led to, in multiple different places, so we would then have to get into a place where we are traveling to multiple places in multiple time periods and attempting to piece together our best guess of what happened in history. Maybe our best guess at the internal motivations of the people involved in history. 
And to me, at least, all of this is starting to sound a lot like what we do in history right now to try to get a full picture. So rather than ending the concept of history, this time travel machine might end up just being another tool in the arsenal of the historian, far from the end of history. Of course, all of that is setting aside the fact that as humans, we can all look at the same exact event and then disagree on what happened. Just based on more current event type stuff that people see all the time in modern day, when some wild event happens, everyone has the video, everybody sees exactly the same thing, but everybody comes up with wildly different interpretations of what happened. There's dozens of different news channels and newspapers and social media influencers with different interpretations. There's YouTubers, there's podcasters, there's trolls on Twitter. It's a mess, right? And I wonder if this time travel idea that Ken Liu came up with in this story would sadly just end up being a continuation of this battle over history rather than the end of history. Earlier, I said I wasn't going to get into all of the characters and the plot points like I normally might, since this is a lengthy short story, it's almost more of a novella, but it's important to point out for the discussion that much of the story is based around what is known to history as Unit 731. Unit 731 was basically a branch of the Japanese military operating in China during World War II, and they were responsible for some of the most heinous crimes against humanity that anyone has ever seen or heard of. In effect, they took Chinese prisoners and victims and performed what can only be described as truly horrifying experiments on these human beings in order to get results that might benefit, in their view, science and medicine. So these Japanese doctors in this unit performed all manner of horrible procedures in the name of science. We're talking about intentional exposure to disease, sexual abuse, violence and murder, vivisection on human beings. And somewhat amazingly, at the end of the war, most members of Unit 731 and the doctors associated with Unit 731 walked away and went back home. There was no justice. There was no reckoning, no Nuremberg trials. Much has been made of the American General MacArthur agreeing to allow Unit 731 to basically go free in exchange for the data from those experiments. Data that would go on in some way to benefit science and medicine to this day, by the way. So you have this sad and tragic way where horrifying events in history, whether it be Unit 731 in Japan or slavery in other places of the world, result in systems and people and future events that benefit people to this day. But back to the story, one of the main characters is interested in going back and attempting to get justice and to have that reckoning because they have family members who were victims of those atrocities performed by Unit 731. To me, one of the things that's interesting about this story is that Unit 731 was absolutely a real thing. And it's something that has been increasingly studied over the years. And obviously people have emotions about it, particularly in Japan and China, and it's still an incredible issue. But the characters in the story and obviously the time travel element and the things that Ken Liu was writing, while they're based on the real events of Unit 731, obviously the characters and their conversations are fictional. But to me, this is interesting because it opens up a bunch of different 
cans of worms, so to speak, that Ken Liu can then explore to try to tell us something about history and the way we study it. One question that Ken Liu asks that has been asked before by all sorts of different people, but the question is, who does or should take credit or blame for the actions of the past? Should it be on the individuals who perpetrated the acts? Should it be the country that represented the individuals? An ethnic group, perhaps? Is it even possible to take blame for actions that happened years in the past? In the story, which is in part based on the real conflict at the diplomatic level between China and Japan, those two countries are having this diplomatic reckoning over the atrocities of Unit 731, how they should be remembered, how they should be taught, and to what extent Japan as a country is responsible to this day. On one side, you might argue that what's done is done, and you can understand the logic of that, but on the other side, one event builds on the next event, which builds on the next and the next, and everything is connected, and nothing really ever ends. So to just say what's done is done ultimately doesn't seem to satisfy a lot of people that are thinking deeply about these questions. One of the characters in the story talks about this idea and how when we tell sort of a typical history, we like to tell stories that have beginning, middle, and end. We like to wrap up certain narratives with a clean bow, and then we like to move on to the next thing. But this character thinks that real life is a little bit different. Quote, If these debates have a clinical and evasive air to them, that is intentional. Sovereignty, jurisdiction, and similar words have always been mere conveniences to allow people to evade responsibility or to sever inconvenient bonds. Independence is declared, and suddenly the past is forgotten. A revolution occurs, and suddenly memories and blood debts are wiped clean. A treaty is signed, and suddenly the past is buried and gone. Real life does not work like that. However you want to parse the robber's logic that we dignify under the name international law, the fact remains that the people who call themselves Japanese today are connected to those who called themselves Japanese in Manchuria in 1937. And the people who call themselves Chinese today are connected to those who called themselves Chinese there and then. These are the messy realities, and we make do with what we are given. End quote. So as this character points out, the slate doesn't actually get wiped clean, but sometimes we pretend it does. And yet, there are these connections and these temporal threads that bind people and nations together through time and through space. So how do we litigate that from a historical perspective? Another concept that is connected to this idea that Ken Liu adroitly brings up is this idea of digging up old history. A lot of people just don't like to have to answer questions about the past. Some people would rather let sleeping dogs lie. Some people might say, the world is better now. What good is bringing up this old stuff going to do? Some people might just be apathetic about the past. While, of course, other perspectives might say that countries and governments and peoples need to face up to their history and to the past as a whole. So you have these different perspectives and ways that people think about bringing up the past and having these reckonings and attempting to get justice for actions that happened years ago. I think Ken Liu uses Unit 731 as an example of this. It's a fictional story here, the man who ended history, but some of these reactions that people have in the story to learning about what happened in Unit 731 are based on real reactions that he researched. So what would happen if you dug up the past of Unit 731 and asked people in Japan or asked people in China about those events? 
How would people react to learning about Unit 731? How should they react? Again, these are fictional accounts, but they are based on things that Ken Liu read about people responding to Unit 731 and learning of the horrors of the human experiments that took place there. Liu says, quote, John, last name withheld, high school teacher, Perth, Australia. You know old people are very lonely, so when they want attention, they'll say anything. They would confess to these ridiculous made-up stories about what they did. It's really sad. I'm sure I can find some old Australian soldier who will confess to cutting up some ABO woman if you put out an ad asking about it. The people who tell these stories just want attention, like those Korean prostitutes who claim to have been kidnapped by the Japanese army during the war. Now, Patty Ashby, fictional homemaker, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I think it's hard to judge someone if you weren't there. It was during the war, and bad things happen during wars. The Christian thing to do is to forget and forgive. Dragging up things like this is uncharitable, and it's wrong to mess with time like that. Nothing good can come of it. Sharon, actress, New York, New York. You know, the thing is that the Chinese have been very cruel to dogs, and they even eat dogs. They have also been very mean to the Tibetans. So it makes you think, was it karma? End quote. Again, this is all a fictional story here, but those fictional reactions from people feel pretty accurate to me, at least. People would find ways not to care. It could be cloaked in a sort of religious karma type of vibe. It could be cloaked in a moral relativism type of thing where people don't want to judge the past by the same standards as today. It could be cloaked in a kind of tough guy, contrarian, well, I don't trust the media or the government or academics who are telling me about this event, so I don't buy it. Whatever the reason, it's out of sight, out of mind for many people. But on the other hand, I do know that if I was a victim like this, I wouldn't want to be forgotten. I would want my story to somehow be told in a way or with the result that makes the world a better place. If that came five years or 50 years or 100 years later, I would still want to be remembered in a way that makes the world a better place. So that being said, getting people to care about events in the past is a huge and difficult task. But would this time-traveling history machine change anything? As I was reading this story, I made a bit of a connection to the philosopher Peter Singer. He is often associated with this thought experiment where he imagines you're walking down the street to work in the morning when you notice a child drowning in the stream right next to you. Would you jump in and save her? Of course you would. You would get your clothes dirty and wet and all of that but you aren't going to ignore the death of a child that's happening right in front of you and that you can easily prevent. So if that's true, Singer argues, why don't you do anything to help the millions of children who are starving every day, thousands who are dying in war-torn or famine-ravaged countries? It would actually be easier to help them, assuming you have some money. You wouldn't even have to get your clothes wet he wouldn't have to jump into any streams. Literally, with the click of a button, you can hop on to the effective altruism movement and save lives immediately. So Peter Singer asks, why don't you? Some people think it's this idea of proximity. We are willing to help people that are close to us, but not necessarily the people whose names we don't know or whose faces we can't recognize or who we don't have any connection to. So in a similar way, where we don't seem to want to help the far-off stranger too much, in this case, for this story, we don't seem to care too much about justice for the far-off victim or the ancient historical victim. But what if it wasn't just some ancient, vague concept of common humanity? What if by traveling to the past and experiencing it through this time machine, 
you could break people out of their apathy. In the story, one of the characters explains why making this time machine was so important for the creator of it. Quote, Evan believed that time travel would make people care. When Darfur was merely a name on a distant continent, it was possible to ignore the deaths and the atrocities. But what if your neighbors came to you and told you of what they had seen in their travels to Darfur? What if the victim's relatives showed up at the door to recount their memories in that land? Could you still ignore it? Evan believed that something similar would happen with time travel. If people could see and hear the past, then it would no longer be possible to remain apathetic. End quote. Could a time travel machine become an empathy machine to make better citizens of the world? Throughout the story, Lou points to the idea of forgiveness, which I think is related to these ideas that we've been discussing. But is justice the same thing as forgiveness? Is it possible to achieve forgiveness and equanimity for actions in the past without achieving justice? What is justice? Is acknowledgement and remembrance and exposition of the tragedies of the past the same thing as justice? All important questions, in my view. And furthermore, who gets to have forgiveness and justice? Who is justice for? For example, say you had this time machine and could go back to the events of Unit 731. You could identify individuals who perpetrated these horrible crimes. You could learn about what happened. And as a result, you could potentially prosecute any people who are still alive or put measures in place to prevent this sort of thing from happening again. And you could achieve some measure of justice. But as is the case in this story, imagine you only have a limited number of seats on the time traveling device. Who should get to go back in time? Should it be the families of the victims who want a more personal form of justice and understanding and memory? Or should it be researchers or politicians looking for any number of other things from the truth of what happened to diplomatic solutions to problems between countries as a result of these old events? Is the suffering of victims of the past a private pain or part of a shared history? Should we be respecting the privacy of the people who went through these terrifying events and their families? Or do certain events transcend the individual and enter the realm of the public domain? Tough questions. Another dilemma that Ken Liu brings up is the idea of telling individual history that contains a lot of the human element. This is something that is important to the study of history so that people are able to learn and make real human connections to the past. But there is a downside to telling this individual history and the history of the ordinary person, as podcasters like myself like to do. Could it potentially sensationalize things and leave people with the idea that things happened a certain way that isn't necessarily generalizable to the entire situation? To some scholars, individual stories of the victims is not necessarily the best historical practice. Lou quotes a fictional scholar here saying, quote, because of our limited capacity for empathy for mass suffering, I think that there's a risk that this approach would result in sentimentality and only selective memory. More than 16 million civilians died in China from the Japanese invasion. The great bulk of this suffering did not occur in death factories like Peng Fang or the killing fields like Nanjing, which grab headlines and shout for our attention. Rather, it occurred in the countless quiet villages towns, remote outposts, where men and women were slaughtered and raped and slaughtered again, their screams fading with the chill wind, until even their names became blanks and forgotten. But they also deserve to be remembered. It is not possible that every atrocity would find a spokesperson as eloquent as Anne Frank. 
and I do not believe that we should seek to reduce all of history to a collection of such narratives. End quote. Now, of course, the counter to this is that if you leave out those individual stories and the perspectives of the victims and the minorities and the little guys, you often get a sort of zoomed out government level history. And the way that governments connect with history and respond to history then colors the way that its future citizens view that history, which arguably distorts things even worse. Ken Liu has a fictional professor here talking about the dangers of this zoomed out government level approach where you're now allowing a institution to craft a narrative, saying, quote, And so, across a narrow sea, China and Japan unwittingly converged on the same set of responses to the barbarities of World War II, forgetting in the name of universal ideals like peace and socialism, welding memories of the war to patriotism, abstracting victims and perpetrators alike into symbols to serve the state. Seen in this light, the abstract, incomplete, fragmentary memories in China and the silence in Japan are flip sides of the same coin. Talking about Evan Wei, the creator of the history time travel machine now, he says, The core of Wei's belief is that without real memory, there can be no real reconciliation. Without real memory, the individual persons of each nation have not been able to empathize with and remember and experience the suffering of the victims an individualized story that each of us can tell ourselves about what happened is required before we can move beyond the trap of history. End quote. So you have this struggle between a more personalized, a more ordinary, a more individual-based history that has its own pluses and minuses, and you have that struggling against this more institutional and ideological way that governments and ideologies and institutions can color history and impact the way that people view it. Again, the concern with this more zoomed out view of history is that suddenly big words like patriotism and peace seem great, but they might not be the best levels of description when dealing with real victims and real memories and real history. Sometimes the institutions or the ideologies controlling information they matter just as much as the information itself. So at any rate, we've taken a bit of a long and questioning and winding road to get here, but it seems like this time-traveling history machine, far from ending history and ending the controversy over history, would probably just create more problems and exacerbate the battles we already have over history. In the story, Evan Way, the creator of the machine, is implied to end up killing himself, and his partner talks about the impact of his machine. Quote, History, as it turned out, was a limited resource, and each of Wei's trips to the past took out a chunk of the past that could never be replaced. He was riddling the past with holes like Swiss cheese, like early archaeologists who destroyed entire sites as they sought a few precious artifacts thereby consigning valuable information about the past to oblivion. Wei was destroying the very history that he was trying to save. End quote. And now it seems like we're back at square one. We have this study of history that is flawed and complex. Swiss cheese. And yet it provides the essential function of collective memory, humanity, and shared knowledge. One of the characters says late in the story that, quote, the fact that we can never have complete, perfect knowledge does not absolve us of the moral duty to judge and to take a stand against evil, end quote. So while the study of history may always be Swiss cheese in a sense, there's always going to be flaws and holes and complexities in the story of history, that doesn't mean history isn't important or that we can't learn lessons about the past that are absolutely essential. It also doesn't mean that even if we 
don't have a perfect record of the past, that there isn't a perfect record of the past. It may not be accessible to everybody, but in some ways, the record of history is nothing more than the chain of cause and effect that has happened throughout all time and has led each of us to this moment right here. Evan, the creator of the Bohm Carino particles that allowed him to create that history time machine, his partner sums up this idea of the past never dying, saying, quote, Evan died thinking that he had sacrificed the memory of the Unit 731 victims and permanently erased the traces that their truth left in our world. All for naught. But he was wrong. He was forgetting that even with the Bohm Carino particles gone, the actual photons forming the images of those moments of unbearable suffering and quiet heroism are still out there, traveling as a sphere of light into the void of space. Look up at the stars, and we are bombarded by light generated on the last day the last victim at Ping Fang died, the day the last train arrived at Auschwitz, the day the last Cherokee walked out of Georgia. And we know that the inhabitants of those distant worlds, if they are watching, will see those moments in time as they stream from here to there at the speed of light. It is not possible to capture all of those photons to erase all of those images. They are our permanent record, the testimony of our existence, the story that we tell the future. Every moment as we walk on this earth, we are watched and judged by the eyes of the universe. For far too long, historians and all of us have acted as exploiters of the dead. But the past is not dead, it is with us. Everywhere we walk, we are bombarded by fields of these particles that will let us see the past like looking through a window. The agony of the dead is with us, and we hear their screams and walk among their ghosts. We cannot avert our eyes or plug up our ears. We must bear witness and speak for those who cannot speak. We have only one chance to get it right. End quote. So it turns out that even if emotional catharsis and historical objective inquiry are at odds with each other, the battle over that and the battle over history is just as much a part of history as anything else. Maybe every part of our life and death and our history as a people and as a planet happened and is all part of a collective record. Even if we can't access it perfectly, it's there. And maybe we should live as if people from the future are going to come and judge us on the actions that we take now. Do you want to be remembered or forgotten? And what if you are that future and it comes time for you to do the judging? Are you going to remember or forget? Remember?